So unfortunately, you guys aren't going to be able to catch the full episode here on YouTube because it only captured 20 minutes of the video. If you guys want the full episode, head over to our Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Links are down below. Again, apologies. Next week will be better, but we only have 20 minutes of it. So here he goes. Hope you guys enjoy it. Like, subscribe, notification bell. See you guys in our next episode. Thank you. Welcome back to another episode of Checking From Behind. I'm Preston. Join alongside Zach. Um, I am wearing a Sabres jersey today uh, for good reason. I just got back from the Sabres game. Uh, the Sabres just beat the Detroit White Wings 5-3. It was a great game. Uh, we have plenty of stuff to talk to uh, about today. But first of all, Zach, how you doing today? I'm doing great. Fun episode. Been up since 5 in the morning because I work at 6 to 6.30 a.m. on Saturday. Absolutely blasted with tiredness. but Rise and grind, baby. Rise listen, and grind. We're here. You we're... ain't tired. You ain't trying. Exactly. All right, so tell me about it before we get into the news. How was the Sabres game today? It was it was a great game. I mean, Detroit is a good team. That Larkin, uh, DeBrincat, uh, uh, Raymond line that that's that that's good. They're scary every time. I I, I had to like kind of pay it more a little bit more attention every time they're on the ice. They're dangerous, especially once they get going. Um, I mean, DeBrincat scored a goal. It's super super quick release. They had a lot of great. Uh, Raymond scored a really nice shorthanded goal. Have a stupid play by Dylene, but. You know, I got to give credit to the Sabres. You know, we were hating on them a couple weeks ago. They're 4-4. Four and four. They've won three in a row. Um, they look a lot better defensively. I mean, they got a really big test coming up on Monday, though. They got the defending Stanley Cup champion Florida Panthers and Kachuk's back, and it looked like Barkov might be back and on Bobrovsky's Monday, too. And going to be starting most likely. Most likely. So a little uh, – probably a much different kind of Florida team than they played a couple weeks ago when they beat them in regulation. So um, I do feel a little bit more comfortable about the Sabres going into this game against the Panthers than I was going. I don't into, know. I mean, Barkov feasts against us. Like that's the Sabres. But, yeah, but like still though, this team looks more. It, I know it's only been two weeks, but more mature already. Yeah, they're they're learning how to win, and I thought they did a really good job in the third period playing more, a lot more defensively minded. I mean, Detroit had a couple good chances. Patrick Kane missed a. Wide open net, the hit Brink the post. Had a puck roll off. His I don't stick. know what he. Had. I don't know what was going on. I didn't see the puck roll off his stick because he had the puck like right, mm -hmm. right in the crease there. And everyone was like, "What is he doing? Like, why, why didn't he shoot that puck? Because if he shoots that, that's probably a goal." Yeah. You know, I mean, the Sabers will take those those lucky breaks, but I mean, a win's a win. They scored four goals. I thought Tage Thompson looked terrific. You know, he's he's looking like himself. You know, last year he had a bit of a down year. I think a lot of injuries. Oh, he, he wasn't he wasn't healthy from I feel like more than ten games. I mean, he's already got seven goals this year. He's got ten points already. Um, that whole Tuck Paterka Thompson line looks awesome. Disgusting. I thought Darlene, besides that run, really stupid play he had on the power play. I thought he had a good game. He had a three assist. Uh, Byram had a lucky goal, but you know I thought they played a really strong game against Dallas the other night too, and I was very impressed by the Stars. Zach, Zach was at that game with me. And we were both impressed. It was just a good game in general, I thought. And it's crazy, too, because the Dallas Stars that game, I know I mentioned to you, but for the audience, that was an off game for Dallas. They were they had opportunities. They couldn't score. They yeah, couldn't they score. just couldn't, they couldn't they get were, it back in. They couldn't get score until, like, until it was too late in the they game. They were missing the net. They, there was a pass where I don't know who was off, but going towards UPL is the right board. So in Dallas's favor, off the left half boards in the Sabres zone, Pass leaks out to Tyler Sagan, missed the stick by probably about less than a foot, or else it would have been one on one with UPL. And he honestly, I mean, Luke did play a good game though, because there was great. points in that game where Dallas was controlling play because you know they're one of the best teams in the league. They're going to dictate play a lot of the time, especially against a team that's not as great as the Sabers. But they hung on there. They got a really big win that I didn't think was going to happen. You know. Yeah, if the, the Sabres just got to keep it going. I'm not going to believe until I see a little bit more consistency. I want to see this happen for more than just like a three, four game stretch, to be honest with you. And All I, right. Yeah, so, but much better for the Sabres. They're actually in second place in the division right now. That whole Atlantic Eight division. Eight games in, nine games in. I mean, that whole Atlantic <laughs> division right now kind of looks mid. Like, I mean, all the teams are kind of right in that yeah. conversation. I mean, Florida's ahead right now. They have 11 points, but, you know, Buffalo's got nine. There's four teams with eight points, and I think Montreal, I think, has seven points. So it's a. I mean, Grant. I know it's early in the season, but it's a complete clusterfuck in. I mean, the Atlantic, the Atlantic should be one of the more competitive divisions in the league this year, because you got. I, I would say every team in that division is pretty decent. Um, you know, obviously you have the defending cup champions in Florida, uh, Toronto, Boston, Tampa Bay still hanging around. Ottawa's looking pretty solid to start the season off. Detroit, maybe I work some things defensively, but they could score a lot of goals in Montreal. I mean. 
they're probably the worst team in this division. But but I mean that's not a bad thing. But though. they're it, they're still really young, like, and they 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 have they have an electric offense, and they're gonna win games. I will say if Montreal goes out and gives us seventy eight points, and they're last in the division, we might the seventh place team might legitimately have eighty five points. Yeah, no, I, like, I think the Atlantic Division is the most competitive division in the league. Like, and then you take a look at the Metro divisions, like Devils, twelve points atop, but they also have eleven games played. If you goes by points percentage, Washington is in first place. Yeah, in Washington Metro, by points percentage. Kudos to Washington. They had a very busy offseason, made a lot of moves. They look great. I, I'm pretty sure. I they think might Jacob Tricker was a really great pickup for them. Um, Pierre Luc Dubois, I haven't really noticed him too much. Uh, Andrew Mangiapane has been really good for them too. Mm-hmm. You know, they did. They made a lot of big swings in the offseason to try to try to get better. You know, they they. A lot of people say it was a fluke that they made the playoffs last year. I kind of agree with that. Kind of got their goalies got hot at the right time of the year, but you know, was Washington, Washington. Yeah. I don't. I I thought last season was a fluke. I think I'm talking about they, last year. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Last season was a fluke. Yeah. I do like the fact. I know we talked a little bit about it when they made the moves. Like they they recognize like if they made the playoffs last season with that team. Granted, Charlie Lindgren helped them a shit ton. Oh, he's like, the reason they made the playoffs. Correct. Yeah. So. I mean, Ovi also remembered how to score, so. I'm pretty sure the last 30 games, he was close to, like, 23 goals or something close, like, 20-ish goals range. Yeah, I mean, he's got two to start this year. I think one's an empty netter, but, hey, Ovi's going to take Ovi's going to take whatever goal he can get. He's chasing greatness. So. It can be 43 empty net goals. It does not matter. So let's move into the actual stuff that happened earlier this week. I'm going to start with the first contract extension that happened with Shea Theodore. He signed a 7 by $7.4 million deal extension with the Vegas Golden Knights. Yep. And it's crazy because over the offseason, there is rumors going around that Vegas might be looking to trade. I honestly thought it was going to be a foregone conclusion that they were going to trade him. I didn't know how they were going to make the money work. I, st- I still honestly don't really know how they're going to make the money work. For Vegas, you know, because we, we were talking, we had a, we were talking about this last night. You know, Eichel's getting a new contract soon. Next year is the last year of his deal. He's making ten million right now. The way he's playing, he'll probably get maybe eleven, twelve million dollars in his next contract. Um, you know, Mark Stone's getting nine and a half million dollars for the next three years. Uh, Hurdle, that contract's not too bad. I mean, they got some decent values, but then the defense, they're paying for Tangelo $8 million for the next two years after this. Noah Handovan, 7.3, and then Shea Theodore is going up from 5.2 to 7.4. So, Oops. and they also don't have a goalie under contract next season. And I don't know if I'm Vegas, if I feel super comfortable with Aiden Hill you know, being the continuous starter going into next year. They need to find more of a long term solution for goaltending, I think. Don't look now, but Shea Theodore is on pace for 82 points. Oh, Shea Theodore is a great defenseman. Like He deserved this contract. It was just, I thought it was a foregone conclusion they were going to trade him just because I don't know how they're going to make the money work. I don't, Vegas always seems to make the money work, though. We say this every year, not, like, not just us, but like the general NHL community and everybody else says, like, how is Vegas going to make the money work, this and that. And they always seem to oh, make I, the money work. I mean, work. I know the cap's going up next year, and that will definitely help them, but I mean... It, this is looking like a team that's going to be very top heavy, and they're going to have to get some good value contracts for that bottom six and the, the second, pa- the third pair defensemen. I mean, Petrangelo. I, I don't know. That might be a cap casualty in a couple of years. That I could see Vegas. That's I, at some point. Like I know he's unbuyoutable right now, but they're eventually. It's eventually going to happen. Because yeah, I mean, if if I was Vegas and I had to pick a defenseman just to kind of cut ties with and move on from, it'd probably be him. He's thirty four years old. He's been everything they wanted him to be. I mean, they signed him. Mm-hmm. They won a cup with him. That's what they wanted from him. You know, he is the assistant captain. But if that, that cap hit, and, you know, he's going to be 35 next year. I mean, Vegas is kind of ruthless with how they get rid of players. If they don't think they need you anymore, or you're not part of their vision anymore. They're not afraid to just completely cut ties with you. Correct. And what I will say, Even though, if they had to give away a first-round pick just to get rid of a contract, they, they would. And that's the case with Petrangelo is like if a team's like, we'll take I'm on the contract. I'm not saying he's bad. I'm just saying if they, I had to pick a player from – because Petrangelo, I think, is still a solid defenseman. I I don't know if he's – I think he's below average now. Like last season, we kind of saw the decline of him. Like the 22-23 season, he was good for them. He was genuinely good. I mean, then, last year he was probably he was an issue for them in the playoffs because he couldn't stay out of the freaking box. Dude, he took. Pen- it felt like every time he was on the ice or every other. I time mean, he he's the reason why they lost some of those playoff games is because he could not stay out of the box. Right, and, and Dallas was just goading him into making stupid decisions. He kept taking the bait. I will say, 
everybody that writes Vegas off might be an idiot because Vegas, oh, Vegas is going to be competitive. Like, they're, so, they, like, they're always going to make the move that will make them stay competitive. Like exactly. Like they they don't do too much. So like they they'll do whatever it takes to win. And you have Jack Eichel who's playing at a Hart Trophy level right now. We have Barbershop and Mark Stone on that line that are playing phenomenal. William Carlson's coming back too. He just got they just activated him the day off of injured reserve. So you're adding another weapon to the forward group, and I get you lose six pieces, some decent depth, mind you. Um, but then on the back end, like you're fine. Even with Aiden Hill, I think Aiden Hill is a fine goaltender. I, I think he's more of a stopgap goalie still, though. I don't know. Like I know he's he, not their long term. I know I know they won that cup with him, but that team was really good. He had an insane playoff run, and he's ever since then he had a hard start last year. He got hurt, didn't really look great down the stretch. He was pretty good for them in the playoffs, and then this year he's been kind of pedestrian as well. It's just Vegas, I think, has been kind of overcoming that with how well like that first line has been playing with Eichel, Stone, and Barbashev. Yeah. Um, and then the second deal that happened a couple days ago, Lexi Lafreniere signed again that is a seven year by 7.45 million dollar contract i don't think this is a steal necessarily i think this is a fair deal for both sides a good deal because i have seen some people saying that alexi lafreniere can be worth eight eight and a half i think eight eight and a half is a little bit too much i think seven and a half well just below seven and a half is great for him because he provides that offensive upside and he's been improving steadily in his offensive game each season. Last I mean, season, yeah, he's a point per he game player right now points. at this point in the year. Right, like so. Right now, he's on pace for about a point per game, and he'll be fine. Now, granted, I get he's playing with Trotrek, and I believe he's playing with par- partially Panarin as well, and then you have Kreider and Zibanejad up there as well. But I mean, he's in the 80th percentile in def- uh, not defense, in offense right now, and you're paying him to score goals. Defense doesn't matter. I don't care if he's in the eighth percentile. Well, you have Igor Sturkin, so. It, that's fair. You, I mean, to be honest, you still have to play some defense. Yeah, I know, but Shesterkin can bail you out. But like, that's true, and like the Rangers are paying their top guys to score goals. That's why they have the bottom six. That's why they have that loaded blue line to be in front of Igor Shesterkin. Like, you're not gonna go out there and tell Panarin, yeah, defense first. Fuck no, you're not gonna do it to Lafreniere, Kreider, anybody else advantage at right. I honestly really like this contract for the Rangers. I think if Lafreniere probably waits for the offseason to do this, I think he's getting paid more. You think he's getting, uh, like, how much are we talking? Maybe, like, maybe up as high as, like, eight and a half. Eight and a half. That's, I I don't even know what to say because. I don't think him being, like, a point-per-game player this year is out of the question with the no, way that Rangers offense is. No, it's not out of the question, is. but, I mean, like, if he, let's say, gets 70 Let's say, for example, he got 70 points this season, right? Just under a point per game. Do you, if And he doesn't sign this extension. He goes into the offseason. I believe he'd be an RFA. Yes. So are you Lafreniere and his agent would be like, we want $8 million if that happened? And, but then if you're the Rangers, you're looking around and be like, there's certain guys that get, got 70 points in their contract year and got what Lafreniere got or just below. Um, and I know you can look at this like if that hypothetically happened, by the way, speaking, um, if Raymond, let's say you go off the Raymond contract, I think it what got eight. I don't know off the top of my head. Let me so, pull that up real quick. Yeah. So, I mean, you could be that because Lafreniere, like you base the market off of the what's going on the past year, maybe year and a half. So, I mean, at the end Raymond of the day. Got, yeah, 8.075. So, we got 8 point, So, that could be the Rangers' argument. Not the Rangers. Lafreniere's argument is be like, listen, I got the same amount of points Raymond did when he got a contract. I want $8 million. And I don't think $8 million will be far out of the question. I do think that – I don't think 8 is – too too much i think if you went up to the eight and a half mark that would be a lot that'd be hefty in my opinion even though with the cap going up and in what three four years it's probably going to be around 100 million maybe a little bit north of it if everything yeah keeps. i mean but that's why i'm saying i think this is a really good deal for the rangers oh, going this is forward a, this is this is fine i deal. think like i said if lafreniere has that point per game player kind of uh trajectory trajectory and they still got their biggest contract that they need to get done is Igor Shosturkin. And whatever money they can save to put towards the Shosturkin contract is going to matter. How much cap space do they have at the moment and then next season? I don't know going into next season. Okay, I didn't know if it said it or not. Not on this website. I mean, they have $45 million in forwards on the books next year, $20 million in goaltending. So it's about... So that's sixty five between sixty six million dollars for sixty seven if you add up like the extra. So yeah. they got about 
twenty three million, twenty four. Was it going up to like eighty six next year? Uh, eighty six or eighty nine. I'm the suck six apparently. So, so um, they're gonna have some money to work with, but they also got some guys to sign. Like um, Capocacco is gonna be an RFA again. I don't know what that contract looks like. Keandre Miller, what kind of contract do you offer him? Because he's a guy you'd want to extend on a longer-term deal. And if Shesterkin's really going to get $12 million a year, it's, it's going to be interesting. You're going to have to sacrifice some money somewhere else. Yes. Because Igor Shesterkin is a generational goaltender. Yes. Yeah. So, he, he, the Rangers, I think they would still be a good team without him. But I don't know if they can win a cup without him. I, 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 I'm going to go to that point because I don't think the Rangers can win a cup <clears throat> Without Igor Shesterkin, but I also don't think they win a cup if you give him twelve, thirteen million dollars. So like you're in, you're in that space. I don't know, but I think like if you go with like with the trajectory the cap is going up, it might suck for that first or but, second year, the first couple years of that contract. Mm-hmm. But if it gets up to like eventually like that hundred million dollar range, I don't really think I that's an issue. I saw something which was interesting, and the reason that Igor is asking for so much is because when Carey Price signed the ten and a half million dollar contract that he got. If Igor signed a $12 million... Which is insane it, for that time. Ex- right. Um, Igor Shesterkin's contract would actually take... It would be a lower percentage of the cap hit than Carey Price's was. And people are just looking at the plain number rather than, well, if he takes $12 million and in three years the cap is at $96 million, I'm not going to do the quick math, but let's say it's 9% of the cap. Carey Price was at like 12%. That's I mean, a huge you, difference. You, you pay your best players what they're worth. You know, it's just Durkin, I think he has all the leverage in these talks. I think he knows, the Rangers know, that they need him and they're, they're not, they can't accomplish their goals of winning the Cup without him. Because you're substantially, substantially worse without him on your team. He is one of the only, actually, I think he might be the only goaltender in the league that has shown you that no matter what game it is, it can be game one of this regular season, it can be game seven of the playoffs, he will show up when it matters. Mm-hmm. That's why you give him a blank check and you're like, listen, if you're asking for $12 million, we'll give you a $12 million deal. Like, that's plain and simple. Like, there's other well, goals. I mean, but it can't be that simple. The deal will be done by now. I mean, I don't know if Shusterkin's purposefully waiting to, like, for this offseason so he can, you know, maybe wins the Vesna Trophy or has another outstanding year or the, the Rangers – don't make it the distance in the playoffs again, you know, and he played really well. And then the scoring just erases like they did last year in the playoffs. And he carries them back to the conference final, the second round. And he's like having an insane save percentage like he did last year. And he looks at the Rangers like, what more do you want me to do? Like, give me $14 million. Also apply pressure to the Rangers to force them. To sign him too, because he is gonna and he will be hitting the open market. I mean, if, if he, he hit the resign, open market, though, who knows? That would be insane. If, what what kind of money he'd get on the open market? I'd be intrigued to see that. To be honest with you, so honestly, there, we were talking about this yesterday. Uh, this is just a stupid thing. Don't take this seriously <laughs> oh at all. God. Let's just say for some reason the Rangers don't get a deal done with Shesterkin. Right? <laughs> he hits the open market. I, how much are you willing to bet that Vegas will try to sign him? Vegas will 1,000% at least call his agent. And I think if they have to move a big contract, they will do whatever they can to, to get that done. Vegas seems like the type of team to be like, listen, we need $8 million in cap space. We'll give you three first-round picks to take Petrangelo's contract. I don't know about but... three first-round picks because they, the, they need that ammunition for the trade deadline when they get the best player available uh, at the right. trade deadline Connor every McDavid year. in a couple years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> No, but uh, <laughs> I love how unserious we are. <laughs>